we would definitely consider Hampi one of the great, important historical sites of India. As I mentioned before, it's one of the very few sites we have which has evidence of a Hindu imperial city. You must remember that other great historical sites in India, like Kajaras, Tanjore, Yubaneshwar, these are great historical cities, but all you can see in these cities are temples. When you come to Hampi, you have the complete idea of a poor historical city. And this is where Hampi is, I think, maybe unique. It is the earliest and most complete, though of course it's ruined, but still gives you the best idea of a Hindu imperial capital. So here was one of the greatest cities, not only in South India, but probably in Asia at the time. And you can get some idea of how big it was, the fortification walls, the military aspects, the hydraulic aspects, the royal aspects, the religious aspects, all of which is set in a landscape which can be compared to nothing else in India. So one of the most extraordinary things about Hampi is this granite landscape in which these ruins are disposed, spread about. And one of the questions we always get asked, why build a city in this type of landscape? What does it mean? And so we have developed some ideas about why it happened historically that the city was formed here in this landscape. But everybody who visits Hampi never forgets the landscape. There is no other historical city with such a remarkable city. So I think in this respect, Hampi has a very special place in all the heritage sites in India. I haven't much to add to that, except that I think that, uh, to emphasize again, that Hampi has preserved over a huge landscape all different material things that tell about, that could potentially tell about how people lived in the city, how the city evolved, and how the different parts of the city were used. The city outer boundaries cover an area of 600 square kilometers. The, the city walls uh, extend past Tornagadu, where the Jindal steel plant is, that's in the city boundaries, and includes Hospet and uh, north of Rangagundi. Right, the size of the city is huge, but the densest population was in this area, they call it urban coal or oil center. Uh, but there was certainly lots of activity, roads, temples, people living and practicing their lives out uh, between the out of city walls and the inner city walls. So I think uh, the idea is anybody who wants to understand how this place functions as a city experience how it was a city uh, that still are available some of the material remains of the walls, temples, other structures that people live in. You will get different answers from John and myself. I'm an architectural historian, so I use buildings and parts of buildings as the main evidence for building up a sort of idea of what happened. There are many different aspects of architectural history that make Hampi different and more fascinating. We have, of course, all this royal architecture, the architecture that was made for the king and the court in this vaguely Islamic style that we have here at the Evolve Resort. We have copied many of the features of these type of buildings. What is this type of architecture doing at Hampi? What does it tell us? So one interpretation is that it tells us that the court, the king and the court, commission buildings of this type so that they could be part of a cosmopolitan culture, a cosmopolitan architecture that encompassed the architecture of their neighbors and sometime enemies, the Bahmanis, the sultans of the Deccan to the north. Even though they were in a, let's say, aggressive relationship part of the time, people came backwards and forwards in terms of um, builders and artists and artisans, and so they were architectural transfers. So that makes it very fascinating. At the same time, we have traditional South Indian temple architecture. So when the Vijayanagara kings and their commanders commissioned great religious monuments, they drew on inspiration from the Tamil country. So we have here at Ampi these um, temples which have enclosures like this, great gopuras with them. Um, great towers that we have at Hampi and other temples, these are imports 
from the Temple Zone. So when they decided to build on a great imperial scale, they decided to bring architects and designers from the Tamil area, which was part of the Vijayanagara Empire. So they brought all the resource ideas, and so we have these great monuments like the Vitala Temple, Krishna Temple, Yachutaraya Temple, which are in the South India, that is slightly Tamil style, but here in Karnataka. And they were the greatest, most sophisticated monuments of the early part of the 16th century to be seen anywhere in South India. So these are all ideas about architecture that give in insight into cultural movement, a movement of ideas of peoples. And this, I think, is very fascinating. I came to Humpy looking to see, as I said, whether there was some sort of organization in the way that the city was laid out. And uh, within a year or two, I began to get some ideas about that. One of the things I noticed first is that the Ramachandra Temple in the middle of the palace room, the Tonga Hill, uh, which is the tallest hill in the region, and uh, then on Janabri Hill, the hill where Hanuman was born, are all more or less on the north-south line. I noticed then that within the rural area, there were roads that proceeded northward from the Rama Temple that was also in that line. And I noticed that on the river bank, on the bank of the Tungabhadra River, on the other side of the Tunga Hill was a temple that dedicated to Rama, where Sugriva was crowned king by Lakshmana after Rama had killed Bali. So, First, I noticed that there were certain temples and geographical features that were more or less in the north-south line, which is very significant in terms of urban layouts in the modern world and modern world too. And also that several of these places had to do with Rama. So the Ramachandra Temple, the Kandana Rama Temple, and Ajahn the Hill, three things, three places that are involved in the Rhine. Then I learned that uh, many local people consider this to be Kishkinda, the place where Rama came and first met Hanuman and Sugriva when Rama was looking for his abducted wife Sita. And Rama helped put Sugriva back on the throne and, and then sent Hanuman and many others off to try and find Sita. Hanuman found Sita in Sri Lanka, came back and presented Rama the, uh, one of her ornaments. And Rama at that time was sitting on the Avanta Hill, which is another mount in, within the city of Linus. So all these geographical places are tied to the Ramayana. And it became, it became clear that the rulers of Vijayanagara, either explicitly or implicitly, were creating a plan that brought Rama into it. And the first way they did that was making the very most important temple in the center of the city in the 15th century, a Rama temple. And, and in Shastric planning, the central square of any plan is where the ruling deity presides. So in this sense, Rama became the ruler presiding deity, the mandala, organizational plan, underlay the palace, and the way patients the way with the same empire. So I think this one way in which or the, the, the plan had meaning. There was a plan and it had meaning in relation to the Ramayana. The other thing is that I noticed that most of the residential, the very enclosed residential structures, small palaces or mansions, were on the west side of that line, and most of the buildings had the king's public life, elephant stables, the Muhammad Bali platform, the audience hall, various baths, and so forth, were on the eastern side of that line. So that on the east was the king's public life, and the west was his intimate household life. Uh, then later on, I noticed that the line in the sacred center along the river, at least early on, the first temples on the west side of Shalom, the Vaishnava, 
What's particularly interesting to me is that the, is the role of the Gandhara Rama temple. Even today, when the betrothal of Papa and Rupaksha is celebrated, uh, they bring uh, processional icons of the god and goddess in Rama Rama temple, which is on the north south line, and Rama at that temple acts as the brother of Pampa to help go see the bride prince, the marriage arrangements. And this is a place where Shaivism and Vaishnavism come together in terms of the local mythology and celebrations even today. So I think several people have found it interesting how much the Ramayana was important at a particular time. I think it was less important later on with the end of the city to say in the 14, 1400s, it was very, it's just, it's part of that continues today. Well, there are two types of palace architecture. One is the type that we are sitting in now, which was built completely of masonry, covered in plaster with these types of arches. And they, these buildings, these pavilions, watchtowers and audience halls, whatever they may have been, the stables, of course, these are comparatively complete. They're missing, of course, parts. The detail has been damaged. But we get some a good idea of these type of buildings. The other type of buildings were built partly, of course, of wood and terracotta. So these parts of the buildings have disappeared. All we have left are the stone basements of these so-called palaces. We have little blocks set into the floor which tell us that these were the locations of wooden columns. So we have a, a rough idea of the plan, but how it was up on top, like this, maybe with towers, we can only guess. And so we cannot have a 100% sure idea of the appearance of these temples. We have tried to work with the graphic artists to do what we call conjectural restorations of how we think they may have looked. And no doubt they imitated features, curving eaves like this, little towers like that, which we find in temple architecture. So it is a problem we have that we only have the stone basements, so we don't know exactly what the te these buildings looked like, nor do we know what they were used for. We call them palaces. But does that mean that people lived in them? Does it mean that people entertained in them? Did they have meetings there? Did they sleep there? Who was it, these people? Were they the noblemen? Were they the queens? Were they the household? Were they the most important commanders? This we have no idea. So we can only have rough suggestions. These are the, the questions that maybe future research, future excavation may be able to solve. George looks at these buildings as, as architectural products as a result of the kind of clearance work that was done by the various teams working here. Now, I was trained in what's called dirt archaeology. Very careful excavation, documentation of everything that's in the earth as you clear it. Um, and from that, you get clues and ideas of how things were made. When all these palaces, the first thing to know is that all these palaces have been superstructures with plaster elements as well, staircases and decoration and all those things. They were all burnt, probably in 1565. Every one that we know about was a pile of ash and charred timber when it was found. Unfortunately, the tradition in historic archaeology is not to do very careful excavation, if I would have been trained. So they simply laid out arbitrary 10 meter read on top of it and dug things out, uh, threw away the ash and the charcoal and other things were to be seen. They made little maps to about the important artifacts in place, nothing like that. And so all the information about how these things were built, how, they, how the timber uh, was put together, how tall the buildings were, were lost because of the archaeological techniques destroyed all that information. It could have been reported, but it wasn't. It's uh, sad to me, uh, but people here have their own ways of doing things, their own values and their own training, and they don't understand the value of detailed work to 
answer these questions of how things together and how they were used. We did have one student who was uh, who asked the state archaeological department to collect pottery, broken pottery from the floors of one palace excavation. And she was able to tell from the kinds of pottery that was there, that was certain ones were used for storms, certain ones were used for shrines, and something like that. Um, it's pretty clear that these were, that, that they were domestic, they had the domestic components, all these buildings. They were storerooms, they were indicated by the different kinds of pots that were found there. And, uh, and they probably also had reception functions, very formal reception functions, maybe entertainment. People could entertain them, uh, slept there, presumably, showed off their status to the visitors. One of the things I noticed quite early on is that certain palaces in the most enclosed areas are you get to them by going through a series of courtyards. And for example, if you pass through the Ramachandra Temple, you come into a great big courtyard, go through a gate, a big courtyard, you turn south, you go through a very big gateway, you go into another smaller courtyard, and you come into a, you have a smaller courtyard with a gate, turn right, make another another gate, brand a gate, then you go again into a series of little increasingly smaller, probably highly decorated courtyards. With, with wooden doors, uh, small wooden doors, and rooms around you where people will be sitting, or officers, of administration, or security, and then you get to the palace. So the control of access to palaces is very much an important part of the plan of these this, uh, palace ceremonies. So about the uh, general population, the, the common people. people. One of the questions we're all, always asked, how many people lived in the city? What was the population of the city? And this is not a question we can answer with any accuracy. As we know, it was considered one of the most populous cities in its day by visitors. And that's something it's impossible to estimate because almost all evidence, not quite John was saying about some evidence, almost all evidence of everyday dwellings for everyday ordinary people has disappeared. This is not surprising because such dwellings were built of mud, of bamboo, of thatch. Even if they just abandoned for two or three years, they disappeared. So, uh, we know this because until recently in many of the villages in this area, you could still see such houses that, you know, poor people lived in these very ephemeral uh, buildings, which could not leave an archeological trace. But one of the things that uh, we would like to know more about is how many houses were built close together and how were they arranged in this landscape which as you know is very rocky very rough how could so many houses be built here and one of the archaeological clues that we discovered was now and again we found holes set into the rocks which seemed to be plugs to hold up a terrace so instead of a sloping shelf of rock Maybe in Vijayanagara times, it was like this. There were various terraces with built-in dirt, with held up with plugs of dirt. One clue for this is that the valleys are filled with the earth, as if all this dirt washed down. Meters and meters of earth are in the bottom of the valleys, which cannot be explained from just the earth there. It must be washed down from there. So we can imagine that once upon a time, there were these terraces. And on these terraces were very dense, huts, thatched huts, in which people lived, in which were the general population, not the elite, but the people who serviced, who came to work. Thank you. Sorry? Rock on hill. Yes, and now John will talk about the archaeological <laughs> evidence for the... Yeah, I mean, that's the thing that George talks about is something that we discovered when we started doing intensive mapping of the site, that there were all these there were terrace walls. There were many, many walls that were recorded and eroding from the sur surface, eroding on the surface of the site. And some of them were terraces, and some of them were remains of buildings, parts of buildings of various sorts. The other indicator of, of how people lived here, are, or at least where they lived, is that there is a huge amount of bedrock exposed on the surface. 
It's mostly called sheep block. And this sheep block, it, the most intensely settled areas of the site, have various markings and holes and excavations into them. Some of these uh, it's common for mortars. They're simply conical holes. People will pound spices, spice for processing their food, for grinding their food. Uh, another one, another thing we found is a different aspect of life are game boards. Game boards are boards for playing different kinds of games. Probably a, board, uh, a dozen different types of games that were played here. And they are found more than 800 examples of them. Some of them on gateways, on the tops of the basements of gateways, where guards would sit and play games while they're hanging around, waiting for something to happen. And we also found them in the shady spots under boulders. And we also found them in places where there probably were chai shops along a major road. So, uh, so many kinds of these remains that indicate domestic activity for an area. The other thing is simply broken pottery. There are millions, probably hundreds of millions of broken potsherds in the earth of the city. And it's very interesting when you first you have to realize that uh, we have divided the city into different zones. There's the palace zone around the Wahazarama temple where there are all kinds of structures, elephant stables and palaces. And then that leads to a gateway, gateways to the east, and that wall area we call the Royal Center. When you move from the Royal Center to the outer part of the city, suddenly the landscape dips. There are a lot fewer potsherds, a lot fewer uh, artifacts carved or carvings on the stones. So probably the population density was less, but the Portuguese accounts that were made in the early 15, 1500s record that there was a Muslim quarter in the northeastern part of the city and uh, we can identify that partly because there are Muslim tombs, two mosques, there are certain kinds of pottery that only Muslims would use, plates for serving food would only be used by Hindus in a traditional context. So and also we found Chinese ceramics some in that area scattered around food. So we began to see that the population was different. There's an area, for example, where there are Jain temples only. There's the Muslim quarter, there's the royal center, which was very closely guarded. There were only the elite were allowed to be. I think there were, as uh, in all traditional societies, there were very few people who were extremely rich, concentrated their resources, both grand structures, and then there were an awful lot of people who had very little and uh, survived on by working for the elite or doing things for the people who worked for the elite. They lived very poor lives. So we see grand architecture in the center, there's no architecture. 